my uh, my oh here we go okay yeah yeah how's that Jim Trick probably good yeah yeah we're good so this is Jim Trick I'm Phil Wyman it's true neither one of us know what we're doing um, on true. Zoom or in life and Jim so uh, Jim and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the Wakufe and the transition that it makes. And I, you know, I think I'm gonna, uh, at least uh, for now, uh, not uh, put on that um, screen share. I'll wait yeah. till uh, perhaps yeah. the end and go out with Chaharango. Um, so Jim, um, I, I remember uh, meeting you pretty much through Elijah. Yeah, your son, the lovely and talented Elijah Wyman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so he was, he was playing music. You were playing music. You were at some places together, I, you know. And I, and, and he went, "Oh, this guy's cool. This is Jim Trick." Um, <laughs> and and then I remember bumping into you at a Starbucks one time, shortly after we first met. Probably don't remember this. It was on uh, the Starbucks out by the uh, the mall in Danvers. And that must have I, been a long. Oh, it was a long time ago. It was about when we first met. And this is kind of my lead in to transitions in faith. <laughs> and, and so uh, you walked in to get a coffee. I hate coffee, but I was at Starbucks because I needed some internet and you know, so. You hate I, coffee? Uh, I hate coffee, man. What yeah, if it's yeah. like a coffee stout? Oh, great way to ruin good beer. <laughs> I just hate the flavor of coffee, you know? So in that sense, I'm a real heretic. I am a tea drinker. They drink fine, fine teas. Mm. So I was sitting at Starbucks um, and you walked in, said hello. And I don't know how we got into it, but there was a discussion um, that was kind of like along the lines of, uh, you know, the defense of Calvinism. Oh. And you were kind of in a hurry. Oh, so, <laughs> so in that phase of my life. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah you were, you were aggressively for pretty much five point Calvinistic stance and <laughs> view of the world and God and people. And, you know, being a Pentecostal pastor, I was like, Oh man, no, not me, bro. <laughs> and we were we kind of said, get into it. Said, oh man, we're going to have to do this again some other time. And, uh, uh, but I don't, I don't have time right now. I got to go. So that was, um, that was how that interaction went. And, now there's been some pretty dramatic changes over that long period of time, which is probably 20, 20, 20 plus years. Right? Yeah, that would be, um, that would be my guess. Late twenties was hyper, hyper Calvinism for me. And so just uh, do we, do you want to clarify things for listeners or would you rather just keep it conversational? Um, well, clarifying things I think is important because there's going to be people who are going to be interested in what does that mean, hyper Calvinistic. So, in, so in basic, so sort of it, within the within the realm of modern evangelical Christianity, there are th really two primary schools. We'll say um, Calvinism, which believes that everything is predestined and there is no free will. There's more to it than this, but right. to make it simple, Calvinists say there is no free will. Everything is predestined. And Arminians, not to be confused with Armenians, <laughs> Arminians believe yep. that it's all free will and, and very little is predestined. So at that point in my life as a Christian, I believed that there was no free will and that everything was predestined and was and as is true with most of the Calvinists I know that was um, a battle that as soon as I found out somebody liked Jesus even a little bit I needed to <laughs> battle over that point I didn't right care if right they were feeding the poor I didn't care if they were uh, loving their neighbor. All I cared about is 
this doctrine of predestination. And if you don't see it my way, how is that possible? Right. Or are you even saved? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Right, 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 I mean, right. I, I borderline, borderline there. I never really crossed that line fully, but that's where I was definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. where I was heading. Yeah. Right, right. And 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 so now as far as being a Christian, where where were you in your how long were you raised in church? Did you yeah, so come to it later? What's the basically what happens is it, it's it's a really interesting story. I was about eight years old, seven or eight years old. We were very strict Catholics. My mom was a CCD teacher. And one of my brothers and my sister started to attend a youth group at a Baptist church. Right. Came home to my mom and they said, hey, we've been going to this youth group at this Baptist church. And the minister there said that God isn't mad at us and we can have a personal relationship with Jesus. And my mom said, you have lost your minds and you are never going back <laughs> to that church ever again. All right. <laughs> and so they, so my mom set it up so that they couldn't go. And they were really bummed because they loved it and they had had a wonderful experience there. Well, a few months later, it turns out that same Baptist church was hosting an adult Bible study and they begged my mom to go. <laughs> and my mom said, oh, I'll go. You bet I'll go. And she and my aunt went to this Bible study where they were going to basically tell the pastor, get your meat hooks off my kids. All right. And they both got born again. <laughs> That's hilarious. So okay. My aunt decided to stay in the Catholic Church as a born again Christian. My right. mom decided to leave the Catholic Church as a born again Christian. And so we were never raised with any of the anti Catholic right. stuff that goes with evangelicalism. We we were raised from and then and then I actually got had a born again experience in my mom's baptism class when she was going to get rebaptized. Oh wow. Okay. From about 8 years old, I have a personal connection to Christ and with the gospel. And but we were balanced, there wasn't any anti-catholic stuff. We were a community theater family and a lot okay. of our, a lot of our friends were gay. And so right. we we weren't raised with any of the we weren't raised with really any of the negative aspects of modern right-leaning evangelicalism that you hear about. And I'm really, grateful. Yeah. I'm really grateful for it. Um, there definitely was the underlying thing that if you had not received Jesus as your personal savior, like pray right. that sinner's prayer, God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I receive you, Jesus, as my savior, that you weren't saved, but we were kind of like a kind, kinder, gentler zealot, if you will. Right. And we were all free will. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lay out my story and then and just to kind of get you up to where we are. I don't want to I don't want to talk too much. Right. But um, right. so we're very free will. And everything is sort of like that more Arminian thing. Uh, you have a choice. Early 20s, I become aware of Calvinism. And I fought it initially. And then I bought it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and, um, and now at coming on 50, I'll be 50 in December, a wildly wildly different perspective on all of it and that's where we're right. at today so. right 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 so so you, you and you you went into uh into ministry yep right I yeah. became a youth pastor eventually yep. got ordained and traveled all over the country preaching at youth for christ events Okay. Um, yeah. Tons of baptisms and funerals and weddings. And, and, and how long did you do that? So I was on staff at churches all throughout my 20s. So right. for a decade and then um, started traveling, doing 
Christian as an adjective, music and speaking, and never, and never really pulled the plug on any of it. So I'll occasionally do a wedding, a funeral, not so many baptisms for really for people who maybe grew up in the church and have become disenfranchised, but still have wanted to have a pastoral figure right. in life to serve them. Okay. But I haven't, you know, I haven't, I'm not like a member of a congregation. Right, right. I haven't served a congregation that way. Okay, so you've made some transitions mm -hmm. from that, uh, what became a strongly um, Calvinistic point of view um, into something different now. Wildly and utterly. Wildly different. different. Uh, how much, uh, and, and the transition, has it been a slow kind of <laughs> growing or leaking or, or you, know, you know what I mean? It, it both, it both uh, diminishes and increases in different ways. Um, or or have has, there been um, points that have been pretty frozen. solid that you've said, um, wow, this doesn't make sense. And Yeah, well, I mean, probably... Gosh, I guess probably the better part of 15 or more years ago, I, it, it kind of went in these layers where it started with what we called church. Right. As a right-leaning evangelical, we really liked to think that we had cornered the market on what church was and, and, and the church and the Bible and the gospel. Right. And so when I started to, to really look at the, at the Bible in light of what we were doing, I didn't see anything in the Bible that looked like church as we knew it. Nothing that was an hour long meeting in a fancy room in uncomfortable clothes on a Sunday morning. Right. So it made me start to think, well, well, that's weird. It's weird that we define church and we would always sort of say the church isn't a building, but then out of the other side of our mouth, we were always like, we're going to church. So right. it started to not make sense. And then worship, the word church, then the word worship. Um, worship, which the way I understand scripture, worship is really about looking after the poor and the and the fatherless and the widow right uh, i think the direct quote from christ is true religion that is pleasing to the father is looking after orphans and widows and keeping yourself from the corruption of the world but in our culture worship had become synonymous with singing songs at that meeting come now right. is the time to worship and people who were doing a bad impersonation of the edge playing guitar would sing songs for 20 minutes and that was worship so i right. was having a hard time with that that definition didn't make sense to me so you go from a definition of church that doesn't make sense to me to a definition of worship that doesn't make sense to me and now right. we've got the definition the word gospel so it was like this progression of like, well, if we've gotten church so frigging wrong, and if we've gotten, if we're so off our rockers on what worship is, what about the gospel? Right. And this idea, because really what we're saying in evangelicalism, which I would consider myself not to be an evangelical any longer or post-evangelical, and maybe some people who are hearing this, from, I've been talking about it a little bit for the last couple of years, but right. it might feel like new news to some, to some people who are watching right now if they're familiar with my work. But really what evangelicals are saying is that most people throughout human history, that is to say statistically, almost everybody that has ever lived is going to some kind of hell. Now, right. some people, if they haven't received Jesus as their quote unquote personal Lord and savior. So that right. is to say, um, for some people that means eternal conscious torment in literal hellfire. 
For other people, it means separation or the absence of the presence of God. For others, it means uh, annihilation that you right, are right. consumed as if you never were. So, so and, and so what you're left with is you can have the greatest guitar player in the world. You can have the coolest guy with the best outfit on stage and the coolest glasses um, saying things that make you feel real good about a lot of things. But the underneath of it really is the idea that almost everybody who has ever existed in human history is going to some kind of hell. And I believed that and I taught that right. for most of my life. Right. And that language still, I mean, I'm flu. I, that's my native tongue. <laughs> Where I stand now is this idea that I think, I think from the Bible, and I want to be clear, I still love the Bible. Right. Uh, as my friend says, I think it's more important to read the Bible literally. I don't think that you can even begin to endeavor to take it literally unless you will first approach it literally. And right. so with that, I think, Phil, that you can make a case for right. an exclusive gospel. Some people are in and some people are out. Right. I think you can also make a case for an inclusive gospel that says right. everyone is in. Right, right, right. But I think when you filter those two potentials through the, through the life and work of Christ, I think, I think you wind up Genesis to Revelation with a gospel that is way more inclusive than it is exclusive. Right, right. And that's not without its potholes. I think both perspectives have their tensions. Right, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I'm going to be a biblicist and live with a certain level of tension, I would rather have my tension be around fighting for inclusion. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, now, you know, we, we, we discussed this a little bit um, last week when we were talking about setting this up. And, um, you know, I made the mention that I'm, I, I still am uh interpretively a pretty uh pretty conservative um christian in terms of my view of heaven and hell and things like that i, I certainly wouldn't go to the place that uh you know as you described your calvinist fundamentalism I, you know I, I've, I've, I've never been there right um that's never been a part of my life um you know so so obviously it, questions pop up um concerning an, an inclusive, uh, a wildly inclusive view, as much as they rise up, I guess, you know, like you were saying, there's, there's holes in it both ways, right? So the, so the questions pop up in respect to um, a wild inclusivity, um, just as, as much as it does with a wild exclusivity. So, um, you know, people are gonna be wondering, so how do we, what do we do accounting for you know, with the Adolf Hitlers and then the uh, and the Dalmers and the you know the the extreme cases that warrant um, such radical um, feelings within us as individuals, right? Yeah. Um, that we can imagine nothing more but judgment in the here and now. Um, uh, you know, I, I have this tendency to feel like a friend of mine once said. We got into the discussion about it, and he said, I couldn't be believe in hell. And, um, you know, and, and then he made some comment about something he was really judgmental about. He said, man, you know, that person should not be alive. They deserve the death penalty. And I looked at him and I said, do you ever think that maybe these feelings we have maybe come from God too? And he just stopped. He went, wow. You know, you almost convinced me that there might be a hell. <laughs> right? Yeah. So... So what do we do with things like that? Well, I, I begin with the idea that I think that we are wired 
to crave justice. Yeah, and I don't. I, think, I agree. And I don't yeah. think that's wrong. I don't think it's wrong to crave. I don't think it's wrong to crave justice. And I also don't believe that I am just enough in the quietness of my own heart, mind, behavior, and experience to, do, to apply vengeance or justice. Which right. is why vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And so what I am, what, what, what I am responsible for, I am responsible for radical, radical love. That's what I'm responsible for. Right, right. And as it relates to some kind of ven vengeance or, or uh, punishment, I am at best ill-equipped and the only thing that I can do is speculate. So that as a Calvinist, yeah, yeah. we would have said, um, as a Calvinist, we would say things like, God is not an idolater. And therefore, anything that does not worship God must be destroyed. <laughs> well, uh, you know, there's a leap in logic just in that alone, but. <laughs> no boy, yeah. Ever. And so what I have to, what I have to, so I can, I can only speculate. And so what I would have to do, and, and Hitler is obviously the, the one that always comes up of course, as, of course. The, as the example uh, to, to the Hitlers of the world. And there are a lot of them. I mean, look, I have, I have a Jew, I have, I love, I love Judaism. I live in a town that is very, we have, a, I have so many Jewish brothers and sisters in this town. Yeah, you do. I love the tradition. I love the culture. I love mm. the food. I love the Midrash. I, I, I love it. And, and so when you talk about, you know, generations of people who lost their grandparents in the Holocaust. But you, you just can't, I, I can't imagine what it is like to be a Jewish person in 2020, mm. knowing that that's what my family went through not that long ago. So take the horror, take the cataclysmic horror of somebody like Hitler and what I, what I have to believe, and again, it's just speculation. I have to believe that God is smarter than I am and more capable of dealing with that than I am. And what I would like to believe is that the love of God is infinitely bigger and more powerful a force yeah. than the worst of the worst of the worst. And, and the, I th so I, I, I think the cre I think the desire for justice is right but how that is administered, I just right. don't. I just don't know. Yeah, and it, you know, a strange thing with it, no matter what position we take, whether we, you know, whether somebody says there's a hell and people are gonna burn in it at 4,000 degrees for eternity, <laughs> you know, or which is one of those, you know, kind of fundamentalist absurdities, or um, that, in, in a sense, everybody is going to make it in some kind of radical reconciliation, you know, and uh, we'll all hug Hitler in the end. Um, yeah. In any one of those positions, um, still leaves us with this 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 
problem that I think of, you know, it's kind of why I use this term wild theology for the podcast, is that it's almost as if um, God can't be seen as anything other than cruel in either position if we look at it from the perspective of our, you know, just kind of common sense. Oh, he's going to let the world go wild and, you know, and people do terrible things to each other and then say, hey, it's all okay. It was kind of fun, wasn't it, guys? Um, <laughs> or, you know, he's going to say, well, I, I did this whole thing to see, you know, who's going to be good and who's going to be bad. And, you know, if, if you messed up for these, you know, 75 years, eternity is going to suck. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, either way, there's... Um, you know, we're left with a position in which, you know, I, I tend to look at it this way. It's almost as if God has placed himself in a weak position of always being perceived as uh, cruel, dumb, yeah, well, absent, well, you know, whatever it might, might be. Yeah. And so, and so, but what I do with that, and this isn't like, this is going to be like very sort of like seminary level thought that I want to lay out. But most people have heard of Abraham in the Bible. Our father Abraham, father right. Abraham had many sons. Uh, and oh, Abraham, you're gonna get out your guitar and lead us through it. Unfortunately, all the actions. I could. Unfortunately, I could. I know. So could I. <laughs> if we didn't have a delay on this, we could do it together. <laughs> I'm so glad that there's a delay and that we cannot. But <laughs> so the thing happens uh, uh, in Genesis where, is it Genesis? Anyhow, yep. the thing happens in the Old Testament. Um, <laughs> and by Old Testament, for my Jewish friends, I just mean the Bible. That, that um, a Abraham, before he is Abraham, he is Abram. And he engages in a thing called a ratification ceremony. Ratification ceremony was something that happened between kings. And in the ratification ceremony, a lower, lowly, lesser king would make a treaty with a great and powerful king. And that treaty would consist of the lowly king taking a bunch of animals, slaughtering them, separating the pieces, and then walking through the pieces of those slave animals while saying something to the effect of to the great king, should I ever break this treaty, this should be my fate. Right. So in the Old Testament, God, God, God calls Abram to slaughter these animals and to separate them. And after the scene has been set up, Abram falls into a deep sleep. And in his deep sleep, he sees a vision of a flaming pot of coal passing between the, the dead animals. In the Old Testament, that flaming pot of coal or torch or fire is symbolic of the presence of the Most High God. Right. And what you have at the very beginning of the book is a God who takes the place of both the lowly, lesser, humble, dare I say, bumbling king and the role of the great almighty exalted king. He assumes both postures. Right. And so, and so, I mean, look, we probably just caused anybody that was watching this to tune out because it's just like- no. <laughs> this weird thing, but, <laughs> <All right. laughs> but, but I think that I, I really, so Genesis to Revelation, Genesis, you have God taking the place of the lowly king and the great king, and in Revelation, you have Jesus, who is both the rider on the white horse, and he is simultaneously the, um, the lamb who is worthy to open the scroll. Right. And it's like, it's like God saying, we are making covenant. I am keeping both sides of it because I love you, because you are my creation. And I yeah. will stop preaching for a second so that I, I can 
take a break. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have the opportunity to talk about this stuff that often anymore, and I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I was I was just getting ready to make that segue away from the theological because I wanted to get some kind of framework for where you're where your thinking is theologically now. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanted to now move to something more personal of the faith transition dynamics, right? And, uh, and by the way, Mara Coleman uh, is watching and she says uh, she'd like you over for dinner, bro. Oh, Mara's a great cook. <laughs> yeah, they're awesome. Uh, <laughs> I would love to eat her. And, and, and uh, Chris Freud, from, uh, a pastor from Carnarvon in North Wales, a good friend of mine, absolutely love uh, this family. And I love this church. Um, so, uh, <laughs> of course, he's saying this is not a trick question. I think it's important to let experiences form out. Our, <laughs> you know, you had to throw in your name. <laughs> but uh, um, so he says, uh, he asks it, if there were life experience moments and any influences playing into this transition, or is it just an intellectual one? And that was, you know, that was... Uh, where we were headed next so it's great, it's great question. But what bro what bumps in the road did you come to okay well <laughs> what uh, what what hit you in the head <laughs> well, i had a couple i have a couple of really really startling ones uh, okay I was leading a men's group and i had my one of the things that calvinism did for me is it really sapped my joy because when you're fighting all the time for a construct and you are um, trying to convince people that that's just isn't going to be sustainable for a happy, for a happy, thriving life, spiritually or otherwise. Right. So in my early 30s, I was leading a men's group and I wound up in Minneapolis going to a John Piper conference. Right. Day before the conference, we were at the Mall of America eating Taco Bell, and I had this group of <laughs> men that we had been gathering with. And of course, like you do when you're eating Taco Bell, you sit and you talk about the origin of evil. And so I had this opinion about the origin. Taco of Bell is that bad? Oh, it's that. I bad. mean, dude, I, I'm I'm from Southern California, so I identify with you know what real Mexican food is, but oh, the I've origin eaten, of evil? Yeah, I've eaten, I've eaten amazing tacos at um, <laughs> Gonzo's in Laguna Beach. So, um, so I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm having this conversation. And then an hour and a half later, we were in Starbucks having coffee and this guy walks by and it's this Calvinist theologian, the, um, this Calvinist theologian named C.J. Mahaney. We had just finished watching a video series by him. He was not slated to be at the John Piper conference. And I lean over to my buddy and I go, that looks like C.J. Mahaney. And he goes, no, that's not C.J. Mahaney. And as he's saying, that's not C.J. Mahaney, I'm getting up to follow the guy down the hallway. At the All right. Hallway. And I look and I go, and I go, hey, C.J. And he stops in his tracks. He was walking with Josh Harris, who wrote I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, I went, and, I went, CJ. and he went, yes. And, and I walk up to him and I got my guys behind me and we're walking towards him. And I didn't realize this, but. You didn't know the guys were following you. Oh, I, I didn't know what they were thinking, which they were oh. all. They were all unanimously saying to themselves, please don't bring up the origin of evil to C.J. Mahaney. <laughs> I walk up to C.J. Mahaney and I say, C.J., I gotta ask you a question. What do you do with the origin of evil? And I'm convinced that he's gonna lay out exactly what I've been saying at Taco Bell. C.J. Mahaney is like, he's like six, seven, and he looks down at me and he points his finger at my chest and says, if you are going to be a Christian, then you had best get used to mystery. And he fucking stared at me. If you are going to be a Christian, then you 
better get used to mystery. And the word mystery. <laughs> like the missing puzzle piece. Like the missing puzzle piece. So that was one that was one really important. That was like, and I had a, I have a I have a couple, I have a couple of those that are pretty wild, but uh -huh. that was one of the moments that really began my undoing and my rebirth simultaneously. Right, right. So, so now, now there's a, that kind of illustration is birthed out of some of the positive aspects of church life, ministers, Christianity, right? I mean, that's, that's a powerful moment in which a um, uh, influential voice in your own life Mm -hmm. spoke something that rocked your world right uh, uh -huh. but you probably had the rock your world in the opposite direction i have two of them where where church life and christianity and leadership was just the opposite of positively influential yeah so five years ago, going on five years, it'll be five years next month, I decided to leave my marriage. And right. I decided to leave my marriage. Uh, it, it was a marriage to a, an extraordinarily kind and lovely and wonderful human being and there yeah. wasn't there wasn't an affair there wasn't a profound moral failing on on either part we had tried and tried and tried to make to make it work and i i made the decision without any biblical grounds to leave the marriage and it was at that over the last five years where I really needed the grace. I really needed the grace that I had not extended. I hadn't extended it to my family when they needed it. I hadn't extended it to parishioners. I hadn't extended it to people who came to me for pastoral counsel. I was never venomous, but I was never particularly gracious. Now, right. I wanna be very clear. I'm very, very fortunate that I walk with a group of people, many of whom you know are mutual friends. Um, Christopher Williams, Rachel and Mark Papadic, um, P.W. Gopal, Brant Menzoir. Uh, this this, and um, if you're if you're hearing this, you know you know who you are. And these are people who loved Jesus and loved me and cared for me and carried me through. They've carried. They still carried me through. But right. the but my ministry at that point was done. I right. the first year getting because I was speaking at big conferences. I was keynote speaking for events with two thousand kids, right? And I was getting the usual calls uh, annually. Hey, we'd like you to come and and do our event. And me knowing how they would feel about my status, and so feeling like I had to be honest with them. And with the exception of the Soul Fest who I'm immensely grateful. So many of the things in my life that are good in my life have come from connection to the Soul Fest. Right. Um, the churches and parachurch organizations and youth groups and men's groups that used to have me come to do programs, they weren't dicks about it, but they also made it clear, yeah, we're probably not gonna be able to have you come. So my ministry was gone. Um, right. And yeah, it really, it really screwed with my head, Phil, you know, but, right, right. but hey, I, at the same time, like I said, it's my native tongue. 
And so I understood it. And sure, sure. I remember, I remember being with my buddy Tim Lother uh, about nine months into realizing that my life in that respect as I had known it was over. Right. The Bruce Coburn concert. Hmm. And as we were good singing- Good concert to be at. It's always a good, I love Bruce. But um, as we were leaving, Tim looked me in the eye and he said, you know, you know, Jim, a lot of people are gonna judge you and a lot of people are gonna be unkind to you. And you just have to know that those people need your love too. <laughs> and I was like, damn it if he's not right, you know? I right. remember, um, I remember uh, Courtney Reed is one of, my, one of my dear friends and she was somebody who also was able to speak to, to say to me, yeah, this is gonna definitely impact the way people perceive you. Yeah. Oh, you're, yeah, gonna, yeah. you're gonna have to be okay with it and you're gonna have to own your folly. I don't right. know if she used the word own your folly, but that's essentially what she was saying. And she's, you know, she's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Man, this time, how much time do we have? Because we're like, it's flying. I know, I, we, we've gone like uh, 45 minutes already. <laughs> This is, is, you know what this is, Phil? This is like 20 years of you and I wanting to have this conversation. Right. <laughs> Blast. <laughs> and, and you didn't get to argue Calvinism with me after all. <laughs> I, I always figure those things kind of fall out on their own. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for, for delivering me from religious certainty. So great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. When, when you... Yeah, you should, you know, I've got a, well, I, I want to say been there, done that, but, um, you know, my story is a little bit different um, in the been there, done that of divorce, because, you know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't the one who left, but the one who was left, right? Uh, the one who was left behind. Um, so the rapture happened and I didn't go. <laughs> um, and and um, for me to... Um, to a great degree, I, I have to say there wasn't a significant amount of theological um, roughing up I experienced through that. Um, God probably figured you had been through enough of that prior <laughs> to your divorce. Yeah, yeah, I already, already got betrayed by my denomination and you know, <laughs> booted out as a heretic because I befriended the radical other. Yeah, so you know, can't be friends with witches in Salem, Massachusetts. So you get out of here. Um, right. Yeah, and that that had a significant um, theological impact in in terms of how I read somebody like the Apostle Paul, and you know, when we talked at the beginning of exclusion and inclusion and you talked about radical inclusion um i've always had this approach to christianity as radically inclusive in terms of my missional behavior toward other people i express my christianity through being radically inclusive and i don't care if somebody's a member of what i might consider or you might consider the family of god i want to make them part of my family right and 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 love them in that way and and I look at my behavior as independent of my theology in the sense that I don't want to become, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the sons of thunder like James and John, you know, <laughs> can we call fire down on them, Lord? Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to become that. I want to be the one expressing um, the acceptance of the Lord at all times. And I'm going to let him figure out the rest in the end. I can I can say, and I'm not saying this because we're friends, but in all, I've been a, a believer on some level since I was about eight years old, and I have, like you, been a lot of places and seen a lot of things. I right. can count on the fingers of of one hand the number of people that I have met in my life who do it as well as you do it. Um, oh, thanks, bro. And and. Um, not really a whole lot else to add to that, but boy, oh boy, yeah. there's, there's, um, look, man, we all have our bullshit, but when it comes to Don't we? loving people beyond the prescription of our subculture, you get it so beautifully, right? 
Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. Well, it's because I'm a weirdo, and you know, weirdos love weirdos. So, the weirder somebody is, the more I love them. <laughs> totally, you're a hairy. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I love subcultures, and and and, and you know, which which then kind of navigates to this thought. Um, you know, uh, well, so let, I'm going to go back before I navigate to that thought. In terms of that experience of divorce, did you find that? it began to change how you thought about scripture, church, Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I had a really interesting conversation with one of my mentors. I don't know if you ever met a guy named David Van Huysen. I don't know if that name rings a bell. No. Um, David was with me when I was morbidly obese and lonely and couldn't find a girlfriend did uh, with me two years into my 16 year marriage when I called him crying saying, saying I think I've made a terrible decision and David when it came to the very very end I was on the phone crying and and he said to me something that I never thought that I would ever hear him say he said to me, your reason for staying is no more noble than your reason for leaving. And you <laughs> yeah, yeah. everything you can. And at some point in time, you are going to have to realize that God's grace is sufficient for you. Right. And, um, you know, the prayer of the, the prayer of the Orthodox Church is something like, um, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, or something like that. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to receive mercy. It's a wonderful thing to receive grace. It's a wonderful thing to, to radically own your own bullshit and to say, I am wrong. I'm wrong here. And for the universe to say, yes, and we love you. It's a wonderful thing to say, I am flawed. I am desperately broken. And yeah. the universe to go, yes, and we love you and we've got you. And I think, and I think, so I think, I mean, we're all kind of simultaneously whole and broken, right? We're whole in our brokenness. Right. We are as we're supposed to be. And I believe that what God is saying to us is, yes. It has nothing to do with my love for you. It has nothing to do with my care for you. There is no hoop for you to jump through. There is no um, dogma or doctrine or practice or meeting mm. or posture or position. You are everything that you are and I am enamored with you. I love you, I've got you. And so, and look, I have my days, we all have our days, but that really is how I endeavor to interact with the world, to be compassionately connected and to say yes. When we talk about, when people used to talk about the oneness, we are one, I'd be like, the hell are you talking about the one? I'm washed in the blood. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but boy, oh boy, if the idea of oneness and compassionate connection aren't the world right now so desperately needs oneness and compassionate connection and the meme culture and the extreme right and the extreme left and the shit show, we need, we need each other there's an irish proverb that says in the shelter of each other the people will live we just need the shelter of each other right now and so i don't think there's any better time in my lifetime for me to have arrived where i've arrived at 
or for you to be functioning the way that you function mm -hmm. in the body and outside of the body. So you don't identify as evangelical anymore. No. You don't identify even as post-evangelical <laughs> or that's not terminology you use. I, I, I avoid it. I would say, I would, I would say post-evangelical. I'm, I'm, I don't want, I'm not, you know, there's the, there's the term Christian universalist, which I find interesting. Right. Um, but I'm not sure that any of it, I'm not really sure any of it accurately. I'm not sure any of it accurately de uh, depicts. I, I, de I, mean, I definitely am post-evangelical. Um, I, right. I use the term ex-evangelical sometimes. <laughs> Right. And the thing that I like about ex evangelical is it really draws a line. And for for my evangelical friends, and for my evangelical brothers and sisters, because the great thing about where I am now is everybody gets to be my brother and my sister. Right. Is that um, I think they've got some splaining to do. Right. And uh, the, so you probably have heard this before, but um, there's this, there's a, a tale of a pastor. You know, a lot of a lot of church buildings when you leave the auditorium, that people like to call a sanctuary. When people leave the auditorium, there's a big sign that says, "You are now entering the mission field." And uh, I forget who said it, but it, it might have been Rob who said, "Take the sign. They need to take that sign." And turn it around <laughs> put it on the outside that's so right walk into that auditorium with the yeah. on the top um that it says you're now entering the mission field as you go as you go in <laughs> so uh where does that leave you in terms of uh how you look at the issue of ministry is it is it is life just ministry now? Is um, is it something you look to you know, in it's, the future, in the sometimes in the present? What tell, I do, look, I, look at that. Yeah, Describe I, that for me. There's no there's no shortage of people in my life who want pastoral care, and I feel <laughs> yeah. I feel qualified and um, and pleased to serve people. All right. I actually, literally. 20 minutes before this call started, got a message from a very, very dear friend who asked me to officiate a memorial service for a family member that passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm more than happy to do it. I'm more than happy. Right. To, I'm more than happy to talk about the good news. I'm, 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 Look, look, I'm not anti the gospel. I'm, I'm all about the gospel. Right. I think the gospel is much, I think the gospel is much better than we were raised to believe it is. Mm. So um, vocational ministry. I don't know, you know, this last year I have begun to, I have begun to feel some rumblings that it might be time to apply my voice again and maybe in a more formal way to people who have gone through divorce, to people who have felt disenfranchised. I don't have any idea what it's going to look like. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's not starting a church. Right, but right. It might be writing, it might be, um, I don't know. But I, I, so from a vocational standpoint, ministry is life, life is ministry, they're both intertwined. Everyone's a minister. This horseshit notion of ordination and seminaries and all that garbage, I don't have any time or patience for it. I mean, for crying out loud here, 
Mm -hmm. the Gordon Conwell Seminary, where you're going to incur, incur tens of thousands of debt to learn about a book that says, oh, no, man, anything. I don't have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not for me. All right, things, right. all men, by all means, do whatever you want to do. But that world, I think, I think I'm, think I'm done with it. I think I'm done with it. Mm. Yeah, especially, especially, you know, especially when the seminary is good, you're going to incur all that debt in the seminary to go in an occupation that uh, pays wages that could be slave wages oftentimes. So are you not a folk musician? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, oh, oh, I course. see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then, uh, <laughs> but, but then again, I guess that's what we're slaves for Christ. I don't know if that's a justification. <laughs> I guess so. I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe that's where we should be a little more Kenneth Copeland <laughs> and be like, name it, name it. We need a jet, Phil. That's what you and I need. Uh, I, no, I do not need a jet. <laughs> and so now, those of you watching Wild Theology, you can press the give button and pay for this uh, <laughs> and, I love the jet. Lord. and so can you for 1995. The greatest story ever told. Um, I don't know if you want to answer this question, I, uh, but let's, uh, I'm happy um, to hear any questions. Okay. So, well, um, yeah, I, I, back, I, I, I told I, you feel free to push. If, if yeah. Yeah. Push. No, no, it's, it's, it's not me. So Adam Wang is asking the question. So Jim, what about dressing, addressing an audience of young black men and women about navigating the world or country they're living in? Yeah. This is just, this is weighing so heavy on me. 53, 54 years ago, a black man and a white woman or a black woman and a white man could not legally be married in the United States. Right. Think about that. Um, think about the fact that when you're sitting at a diner eating breakfast and a black person is sitting at the counter next to you eating their French toast while you eat your French toast, that within my parents' lifetime, they wouldn't have been able to do that. And, and so that while we have, look, we continue, we continue to move in the right direction. We continue to move in the right direction in terms of legislation, in terms of law, in terms of those kinds of things. And I think that what's happening now is there, a, there is a cellular, hopefully there is a cellular spiritual awakening that is beginning to happen on a deeper level so that maybe we are seeing our, our evolution in a hot house season right now. I don't remember desegregation and I don't remember, um, I don't remember the Civil War. I don't remember the Emancipation Proclamation. But I know that with our history, there are ripples that exist on a cellular level. And so what I would say to Adam is, yes, please, where are they? Where are they? And, let, and, and I'm not saying that rhetorically. I'm not I'm saying that right. rhetorically. I'm saying like, if there's if there's a place for me to show up with a guitar and a Bible and a good word, um, I've written nice. it a bit. But boy, oh boy, um, yeah. I don't know if that if so, that makes any sense, but yeah, it does. You know, so one of the things we did over the years, um, we're coming close to when we ought to roll up here. We've been going a little over an hour, bro. <laughs> Doesn't feel, didn't feel like it. <laughs> so it's so good. Even though we're hanging out face to face on a screen, so good to do it with you. Yeah, if there and if there are other questions, I'm happy to. We can we can do whatever you, whatever you yeah, have. Yeah. Well, well. So, um, 
Wait, you know, as you made that comment, it's uh, somewhat <laughs> um, look, looking at that history of, you know, recent Black America, um, you know, there's that, there is that statement that both the church has been involved in as well as the rest of our culture of things that we've, you know, done that, boy, uh, they're terrible. But, uh, but then there's also, you know, you kind of, as, as both of us can look back over a number of years of uh, ministry and pastoring and whatnot, as you've made such a radical transition, are you, there are things you look at and you say to yourself, oh man, I'm sorry, I did that. Oh yeah, oh, oh, Phil. I'll say two, I wanna say two things to that. Um, the first one is the altar calls that I did in the late 90s. You think I'm kidding. I, I oh. know about the pressure of altar calls. When you're a Pentecostal pastor, there's an expectation that an altar call is had with every message. Oh man, right from the beginning, you know, I was like, ah, I can't do this sales pitch stuff. I just oh, fought yeah. it and it was pressured on us. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, definitely the, the manipulation and the scare tactics and like towards the end, mm -hmm. towards the end of that version of my ministry, I used to walk out on stage and my opening was, when I was a kid, we had this guy who used to come to our church and he had a giant Bible and he'd hide behind the curtain and he'd pop out and he'd say, friend, if you died tonight, do you know where you'd go? Would you burn in the fiery pit of hell or would you go to glory? And then I'd go, that guy used to come to our church. But I stand here before you today, not concerned about what would happen if you died tonight. I want to know what would happen if you actually lived today. And that, yeah. that, was, that was my opening to one of my talks. And, um, and so, <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that, I mean, I, I apologized to family members that I was horrible to you. I have, um, yes, there was another thing that I was going to say about that, but but the most important thing that I can say is, yeah, and I don't beat myself. I don't beat myself up about it. I think that I was wrong about a lot of things, but I think my motive was mostly pure. Right, right. I definitely wanted to get asked back. I definitely wanted to earn my, to earn my check um you know michael pritzel right of course you know michael pritzel yeah yeah michael pritzel and i always make the joke of um <laughs> i used to do <laughs> i used to do an event for an organization called word of life and they would do these heavy heavy handed altar calls and they would always say no one is there would be this big pizza party with hundreds of kids and they would always say i see those hands we just want you to know no one is getting pizza until everybody has gotten their hearts right with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and when, yeah. usually if I'm on the phone with Michael, one of us will go, I see your hand. I see those hands. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a little bit like the, uh, the homeless shelters and you got to stay for the message to get the meal right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and those yeah. exist. Um, so uh, yeah, I think with, with there, we'll, We'll finish off, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to test my uh, screen share and see if we can get this song from Tarango, uh, Catalan Bond, come on, and it really is appropriate in light of what you had to say about uh, young black men and women and responding to that question um, uh, from Adam. Adam so, is one of my top five favorite atheists. I love him. He's a great. <laughs> I don't. Um, well, I don't think I do, but. You know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. I, oftentimes, I names and faces, you know, in Salem area, I get, get all that mixed he's up. He's my favorite bartender at my favorite restaurant, but I stopped drinking in January, so he's yeah. losing money. Okay. On but, all yeah. right. Well, this was great. Thank so, you so much for having me. Yeah. So stick around long enough to watch this song. You're going to love it. And, okay. We'll you say know, this goodbye at the end or something. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to say it now, put on the song. And you, uh, is it going to be up so we can share this after the fact, or do you take it? It'll be up. And if you have a problem getting a good copy of it and you want to share it somewhere else, I think. Um, well, yeah. 
I'll, I'll find a way. We'll find a way to make that happen. So um, anyway, this has been Jim Trick from Marblehead Mass and me, Phil Wyman, and I'm in Long Beach, California. And this has been Wild Theology. And we've been talking about transitions in faith and it doesn't get any wilder of theology than finding out that we're all going these crazy different places. Uh, if you haven't seen the whole thing, this will pop up again on you on uh, Facebook and I will place it into YouTube as well. And you can find me at uh, patreon.com slash Phil Wyman. Where can people find you, Jim Trick? Um, you can find me for coaching and speaking at jimtrick.com and for music, you can find me at jimtrickmusic.com. And then if you just Google me, all my stuff comes up. And a song? Yep, I am. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, folks, for uh, the video not working. I'm trying to test this out and I've got some bugs that I'm discovering so uh, uh, but now Jim Trick is going to uh, come on and play a little guitar so that's more fun anyway <laughs> all right this is a um, this song is a true story and I wrote it about everybody that's listening There are two kinds of love, the kind you want and the kind you get. There's the first one that you ever had, it's the one you can't forget, and you can't go there. There's a distance in your memory of a heartache laid aside, and you don't regret the pain you Felt. You are not sure why, but you can't leave it. But all's not lost, and you're not lost at all. All's not lost, and you're not lost at all. There's a little abridged version of that song for everybody. All's not lost, and you are not lost at all. Okay, so one more time. Where can they find you and your stuff? JimTrick.com for coaching, speaking, and thoughts, and JimTrickMusic.com for shows and music stuff. And then if you, I'm on Instagram. I'm not, there's not that many Jim Tricks out there. So if you put me into Google, my stuff comes up. All right, way cool. And this has been Wild Theology with Phil Wyman and with Jim Trick. <laughs> Love you, bro. Love you. <laughs>